stock market meltdowns that defined a nation panic 1907 after decades of gray men in gray suits americans woke on the morning of 15th september 1901 to find that possibly the single most energetic and vivacious of their 78 million strong theodore roosevelt was their new president after the assassination of william mckinley mckinley was elected twice and had been well liked at 58 he was still a young man even by the standard of the day only five foot seven he was short but marked by a barrel chest broad shoulders and ample gut in those days a sign of health and prosperity he had three years left in his presidency but on 6th september 1901 he was shot while standing in a receiving line at the pan american exposition in buffalo new york just three days before leon zolgos a 28 year old anarchist had paid $4.50 for a chromed dot .32 caliber Evair Johnson revolver. As he approached McKinley, Zolgos fired twice, hitting the president in the chest and the gut. McKinley survived the initial attack and gracefully instructed his attendants to be careful when giving the news to his wife. Dr. Matthew Munn was the surgeon available at the fairgrounds and despite the crude facilities and Munn being a professor of obstetrics and gynecology, the decision was made for Dr. Munn to operate immediately rather than transport the president to a local hospital. Even so, McKinley died eight days later, on 14th September. At the time of the shooting, Roosevelt was on a hunting trip in the remotest stretch of the Adirondacks, 35 miles from the town of North Creek, New York. Rather than return to Washington, Roosevelt continued hunting and McKinney died while Roosevelt was still working his way over dark roads from the Tahavas Club Hunting Lodge to North Creek. Roosevelt was still 43 days from his 43rd birthday when he was sworn in as president on 14 September 1901. When McKinley selected him to replace his first vice president, who died in 1899 from a string of heart ailments, Roosevelt was serving as governor of New York. Among the reasons he got the post was that the power that be in New York State wanted Roosevelt out of the governorship and making his mischief elsewhere. Roosevelt had been the ideal candidate for governor of New York when he returned from the Spanish-American War as a hero. Never mind that some of the hero-making had been more Roosevelt's premeditated doing than sheer gallantry on the battlefield, although there was much of that. Roosevelt was a master of self-promotion. There was so little room on the ship taking his regiment to Cuba that only Roosevelt and the senior officers of the Rough Riders were able to bring their mounts, many of the Rough Riders had to walk into battle. But Roosevelt made sure there was room on board for reporters, photographers, and even a couple of early, crude movie cameras, despite the objections of the United States Army. The war lasted less than four months, but the experience seemed to teach Roosevelt that every subsequent professional and political conflict should be charged with the drama and righteousness of this armed combat. Even relatively minor disagreements with potentially helpful businessmen evoked in him the furor of battle. For Roosevelt, losing the battle or being killed was preferable to missing the action entirely. When asked about the possibility that the war would conclude before he got there, he said that would be awful. 
He professed the hope that all his officers would be killed, wounded, or promoted, coming upon a dying rough rider on the battlefield, Roosevelt stopped, shook his comrade's hand, and said, Well, old man, isn't this splendid? Roosevelt wasn't new to politics when he entered the 1898 race for governor of New York. He'd been elected to the New York Assembly in 1882 as a 23-year-old, despite being warned off by friends that those of Roosevelt's ilk, education, and wealth didn't go into politics. Roosevelt simply replied, that merely means that the people I know do not belong to the governing class, and I intend to be one of the governing class. As an assemblyman, Roosevelt was branded a troublemaker and reformer, a title that was anathema to the governing class. When he demanded to be heard on every issue, newspapers started calling him the cyclone assemblyman, and while still a freshman, Roosevelt managed to anger businessmen by exposing a financial relationship between financer Jay Gould and New York Supreme Court Justice Theodoric Westbrook. As he would show in Cuba, Roosevelt made every issue a fight between right and wrong, good and evil, there was no middle ground or go along to get along in Roosevelt and occasionally his indignation made him appear unnecessarily and dangerously belligerent. Even with his war record, Roosevelt needed help getting elected governor of New York. One month after Roosevelt returned from Cuba, he was summoned to the Fifth Avenue Hotel by Thomas Collier Platt, known as the Easy Boss of New York. Platt had served as a congressman for two terms and was in the middle of his second term as senator, but when he called for Roosevelt he had distinguished himself only as the political boss of Republicans in New York State. The New York Times would eulogize Platt in 1910 by saying that no man ever exercised less influence in the Senate or the House of Representatives than he. However, the Times went on to explain, but no man ever exercised more power as a political leader. Platt offered to put that power to work for Roosevelt. He boldly offered Roosevelt the Republican nomination for governor as long as Roosevelt promised he wouldn't get carried away with his reform agenda. The two men struck a purely political bargain, Roosevelt agreed to consult with Platt's people when it came to patronage. The election was close. Roosevelt won with 49% of the vote in a five-man race. But his victory would be a resounding defeat for easy boss Platt. Roosevelt simply refused to do as Platt wished, failing to support suggested nominees and, in an important harbinger, moving to regulate business. Platt quickly had enough. I want to get rid of the bastard. I don't want him raising hell in my state any longer. I want to bury him. Platt realized the only way to bury Governor Roosevelt was to slide him into the job that John Adams, the first to hold the position, had called the most insignificant office that ever the invention of man contrived or his imagination conceived. Platt would get Teddy Roosevelt out of New York by making him vice president of the United States. Roosevelt hated the idea of the vice presidency and threatened to decline the nomination. But Platt used Teddy's fame against him and Roosevelt won every vote the 1900 Republican convention had to offer, with the lone exception of his own. Roosevelt was crushed, I would rather be anything, say, a professor of history. Others were unhappy, too. Mark Twain, who had met Roosevelt more than once, said after he'd been inaugurated 
I think the president is clearly insane. Mark Hanna, senator from Ohio and a power in the Republican Party, asked simply of the men responsible, don't any of you realize there is only one life between that madman and the presidency? On 14th September 1901, that one life went out, and Hanna's madman was in charge. On Saturday, 7th September 1901, the first day the stock market could fully respond to McKinley's shooting, until 1952, the New York Stock Exchange was open on Saturdays for an abbreviated trading session, the Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 4.4% to close at 69.03. But as hopeful news of McKinley's recovery was reported, it regained most of that loss. Only when it appeared that McKinley would not survive did stock prices break again, losing nearly 6% in the three days before McKinley's death, at the prospect of an anti-business progressive reformer in the White House. But just when Americans were desperate to be reassured, Roosevelt's first act as president was to promise that he would continue absolutely unbroken the policy of President McKinley for the peace and prosperity and the honor of our beloved country. Though the prosperity Roosevelt aimed to continue had surely bypassed some, it was true that much of the country was wealthier than ever. The superintendent of the U.S. Census Bureau had said in 1890 that the western part of the country was so settled that the frontier had ceased to exist. Those who remained in the cities were enjoying a second industrial revolution. The American economy had expanded rapidly from the end of 1896 to the end of 1900 when annual economic growth averaged 6% and optimism was being expressed in the stock market. The Dow Jones Industrial Average rallied from 40.45 to 70.71, an increase of 74.8%, including gains of 22.2% in 1897 and 22.5% in 1898. Referring to 1899, when the Dow gained 9.2%, the Boston Herald reported, if one could not have made money this past year, his case is hopeless. The American century had just dawned when Senator Chauncey Depew remarked, there is not a man here who does not feel 400% bigger in 1900 than he did in 1896, bigger intellectually, bigger hopefully, bigger patriotically. As the frontier was disappearing and the stock market was booming, American businesses were growing in size and complexity. In 1882 John D. Rockefeller's Council at Standard Oil had devised the Corporate Trust, a novel piece of financial engineering that allowed Rockefeller and his managers to control the labyrinth of partnerships and corporations that Standard Oil had become. From that single oil trust in 1882, which controlled more than 90% of the nation's oil refining capacity, about 80 different trusts, covering an immense range of industries, existed in 1897. In 1898 a new corporate form was wedded to the corporate trust when New Jersey began allowing one corporation to own stock in another. Delavre followed the next year with even more liberal rules, and the holding company was born. By 1904, 318 corporate trusts were dominating the business world, from steel and copper, crude oil and kerosene, to lead and linseed oil. On 3rd December 1901, President Roosevelt delivered his first message to Congress. He began by eulogizing McKinley, 
then turned to the country's other business, particularly business itself, noting that the growing complexity of industrial development brought with it serious social problems, including pollution, overcrowding in the cities, and an enormous income disparity between the average working man and the industrialists. But Roosevelt then cautioned against dealing with corporations in ways that might jeopardize the resurgence American business was enjoying. The mechanism of modern business is so delicate that extreme care must be taken not to interfere with it in a spirit of rashness or ignorance, he said. Many of those who have made it their vocation to denounce the great industrial combinations appeal especially to hatred and fear. As he continued, Roosevelt shifted from killing businessmen with kindness to turning on them by calling for federal regulation of the corporate form, the legal fiction that allows a group to limit its liability and be treated as an immortal individual through the process of incorporation. Roosevelt argued that since the form, essentially all corporations, had these decided advantages that were conferred by the government, it should be regulated. He also called for the government to inspect and examine the workings of the great corporations engaged in interstate business. He said that artificial bodies, such as corporations and joint stock or other associations, depending upon any statutory law for their existence or privileges, should be subject to proper governmental supervision, and full and accurate information as to the operations should be made public regularly at reasonable intervals. And how might he regulate? Roosevelt gave a clue when he said, since the industrial changes which have so enormously increased the productive power of mankind, the old laws and the old customs are no longer sufficient. When Roosevelt was Assistant Secretary of the Navy, he had professed that only those who dared greatly in the war or the work which is akin to war were worthy. Now he seemed to have found his work akin to war and his next opponent. If businessmen were surprised by the new president's path going forward, then they simply hadn't been listening. James J. Hill and E. H. Harriman didn't like each other, even though both had come up hard and built incredible fortunes as they established railroad empires. Hill originally wanted to be a trapper and fur trader but began his career as a clerk and freight hauler. Eventually, he came to own the Great Northern Railway and much of the stock of the Northern Pacific. This meant he controlled most of the railroad business in the Northwest. Hill was largely self-educated with only a brief period as a scholarship student at Rockwood Academy. Despite his lack of advantages, Hill's railroad empire had been built in part through his alliances in business with J. P. Morgan and the Vanderbilt family. In 1901, Hill's roads from the northwest extended only as far east as Minnesota, and he was anxious to expand his network to Chicago, the belching, stinking center of the industrial Midwest and the crossroads of transportation that fed it. To do so, Hill would buy the Chicago, Burlington and Quincy Railroad, known as the Burlington, for its sprawl of track from Minnesota to Chicago and back west across Iowa, Missouri, Nebraska and Kansas. With J. P. Morgan providing the financing, the Northern Pacific, which Hill had a large stake in but did not yet fully control, reached an agreement to buy the Burlington and its 8,000 miles of track, much of which paralleled that of E. H. Harriman's Union Pacific. Edward Henry Harriman had quit school at the age of 14 
Hill's age when he was forced to leave Rockwood Academy to take a job as a messenger on Wall Street. Eight years later, Harriman was a member of the New York Stock Exchange. Harriman entered the railroad business when he was 40. Dash 9. Initially, he'd been a mere investor, but by the turn of the century he controlled the Southern Pacific and Union Pacific Railroads, and as such, much of the railroad business in the West and Southwest. Harriman did so by aligning himself with the Rockefeller and Gold families. On hearing of Hill's plans, Harriman requested that they buy the Burlington together. After all, Harriman already owned a sizable chunk of Burlington stock, and the Burlington routes served as feeders to much of Harriman's Union Pacific. But Hill rejected Harriman's proposal, leaving Harriman's railroads in a supremely precarious situation. Not only might Hill use the Burlington routes to freeze Harriman out of Chicago, but the Burlington routes west of Chicago could compete directly with Harriman's Union Pacific routes once they were strengthened via the combination Hill imagined. This prompted Harriman to make an audacious decision. If he couldn't acquire enough of the Burlington to guarantee access to Chicago and prevent competition elsewhere, then he would acquire the acquirer of the Burlington. After confirming that Hill and Morgan controlled the board of the Northern Pacific, but owned less than a controlling percentage of the outstanding stock, Harriman began buying Northern Pacific shares quietly. On 22nd April 1901, with the dough at 74.56, Northern Pacific was trading at $101 a share. By 30th April, it was $117. On Monday, 6th May, it was at $133. At this point, Harriman quit being quiet as he realized Morgan had figured out what he was up to. Both camps began buying madly, the next day Northern Pacific, a company that had just emerged from bankruptcy, reached $149, while the dough, at 75.02, was little changed since the buying in Northern Pacific commenced. By Thursday, 9th May, Northern Pacific briefly reached $1,000 a share as the Hill Morgan team finally secured a controlling interest. 9th May 1901, the day Northern Pacific reached its peak, became known as Blue Thursday because this action in Northern Pacific sucked all the air out of every other stock and caused the rest of the market to plunge on May 8th and 9th. As Northern Pacific was cresting, the broad stock market lost 10.2% of its value, with the Dow closing at 67.38. The headline of 10th May edition of the New York Times described it as disaster and ruin in falling market. A handful of robber barons, icons of the Gilded Age, in fighting for a relatively small railroad, the Burlington, had nearly crashed the stock market. Eventually, the protagonists realized they could go on fighting each other or they could join forces in the sort of industrial trust that Standard Oil had perfected and that was becoming so popular with Wall Street. The players came together, the chaos they had caused propelling even normally impatient businessmen to reach an agreement quickly, just 22 days after the panic. On 1st June 1901, an agreement was announced, and harmony was declared, the principals would merge all their holdings into a single entity. The vessel of this harmony was the Northern Securities Company, with Morgan in charge and Hill leading the board of directors 
which her Riman and several fellow raiders joined. Having regained all the ground lost in the Blue Thursday panic, the Do closed that day at its highest level of 1901 to date, 76.59, up 8.3% for the year. The federal government, during one of its first attempts to enforce 1890's Sherman Antitrust Act, had been beaten decisively. The Sherman Antitrust Act had been authored by Ohio Senator John Sherman, a three-time candidate for president, former Secretary of the Treasury, younger brother of General William Tecumseh Sherman, and a man so lacking in personal warmth that he was called the Ohio Icicle. Breathtaking in its scope, the Sherman Act was a response to the emerging power of the industrial trusts, particularly Standard Oil. It outlawed every effort to restrain trade among the several states. The E.C. Knight Company controlled 98% of sugar refining in the United States, and in 1892 President Grover Cleveland instructed the government to sue the Knight Company under the Sherman Act as a combination acting in restraint of trade. When the case ultimately reached the Supreme Court in 1895 the ruling was a disaster for the government. Ruling 8 to 1 for Knight and against the U.S. government, Chief Justice Melville Fuller, reading his own opinion for the majority, said that manufacturing was a local activity and therefore not subject to the Sherman Act, since it was not an interstate enterprise occurring among the several states. Fuller's decision said such combinations could not be suppressed under the provisions of the Act but that rather, individual states would be forced to bring suit to defeat combinations in restraint of trade, a near impossibility in the case of monopolies headquartered out of state. The Knight ruling effectively put control of monopolies beyond the reach of the Sherman Antitrust Act. The Knight ruling also provided Morgan, Hill, and Harriman a road map for deflecting any government meddling into what they called Northern Securities, which was incorporated in New Jersey on 12 November 1901, just two months after Roosevelt had become president and promised to continue McKinley's policies, presumably including not prosecuting violations of the Sherman Antitrust Act in the post-E.C. Night World. It's no accident that J. P. Morgan was the money and the brains behind Northern Securities. Morgan had been born into a privileged position in finance. His father, Junius Spencer Morgan, was an influential banker in London, where he made a fortune during the American Civil War selling war bonds on behalf of the U.S. government. Pierpont's education was peripatetic, he attended schools in Connecticut, Boston, Switzerland, and Germany, learning to speak both French and German while earning a degree in art history, an odd course of study for one who went on to expand his father's small banking firm into a financial colossus. In 1901 J. P. Morgan was 64 and by consensus the most powerful banker in the world. Consistent with that power was an utterly intimidating manner made more disconcerting by a nose grotesquely malformed due to rhinophima, a severe form of rosacea. Though he had played a role in the stock market turmoil during the fight for Northern Pacific, Morgan hated chaos. His son-in-law, Herbert Satterley would later say Morgan loved order and, whenever possible, tried to substitute a pattern for the disorder. Satterley said this explained why Morgan played solitaire while thinking through business problems, bringing the deck of cards into an orderly sequence out of a random deal. Morgan believed the night sugar precedent had brought the northern.
security's problem to a close, but his fame was about to cause its own problems. On 11th May 1901, just two days after the stock market break he'd help set in motion, Morgan was asked about the small investors, the general public, who would be caught in the market sell-off. Didn't he owe them some consideration during his maneuverings? The New York world was happy to relay Morgan's pike. I owe the public nothing. Morgan was becoming one of the most hated men in America, but he had a bigger problem, Theodore Roosevelt. Roosevelt believed in power, having said, I believe in a strong executive. I believe in power. And though Roosevelt hated the concentration of control of the business, he said about politics, I don't think any harm comes from the concentration of power in one man's hands. It was clear that Roosevelt meant his own hands. As news of J.P. Morgan's injudicious quote spread, mail flooded the White House, Roosevelt had changed the name from Executive Mansion to White House shortly after moving in urging the President to act against Morgan and the Trusts. Newspapers ran editorial cartoons showing Roosevelt as a whip-wielding lion tamer with the Trusts at his feet or dressed in a singlet, wrestling the railroad trusts into submission. Even though Roosevelt had occasionally suggested that his attorney general, Philander Knox, pursue possible targets for antitrust action, none of them had been satisfactory. But after being prodded again by Roosevelt, and following a week's research that toured British philosophy, American common law, and the Knight Sugar Trust case, Knox had found a target, Northern Securities. Knox determined that the Knight case had been lost because it had been badly argued, but a suit against Northern Securities could be won, and Knox would argue it himself. Roosevelt had been in office less than five months, but he'd found an endeavor that was akin to war, and his enemy would be the monopolies. On 19th February 1902, Knox issued a statement, some time ago the president requested an opinion as to the legality of this merger, Northern Securities, and I have recently given him one to the effect that, in my judgment, it violates the provisions of the Sherman Act of 1890, whereupon he directed that suitable action should be taken to have the question judicially determined. The next day the stock market lost 1.3%, but the loss was quickly recovered. Roosevelt didn't seem to worry investors. Morgan was aghast. He thought trusts like Northern Securities were good for the country because they fostered calm, as opposed to the pandemonium of Blue Thursday. He also thought the Night Sugar case provided judicial cover. On 22 February, Morgan went to the White House to meet with Roosevelt and Knox. He said he thought Northern Securities should be given the opportunity to make changes in its makeup before charges were brought. Roosevelt, that is just what we did not want you to do. Morgan, if we have done anything wrong send your man, Attorney General Knox, to my man, and they can fix it up. Roosevelt, that can't be done. Knox, we don't want to fix it. We want to stop it. On 10th March 1902, Knox filed the official complaint against Northern Securities in federal court in Minnesota, a state with deep antipathy toward the railroad trusts, and commenced preparing for trial, which began in February 1903. When the verdict was announced on 9th April 1903, it was as resounding a victory for the government as the C. Knight decision had been a defeat. 
the judges were unanimous and unambiguous the acquisition of the northern pacific and great northern railroads by northern securities was a conspiracy in restraint of trade despite the legal thrashing of corporate trusts the stock market held up well on thursday afternoon and closed for the week the next day was good friday as the decision was being digested two days after the northern securities decision roosevelt who was camping on slough creek near yellowstone park tracked and shot a mountain lion but roosevelt must have believed he had felled bigger prey in morgan and northern securities the next trading day monday 13th april 1903 the dow which had been down 3% for the year lost another 2.5% falling to 60.79 The New York Times blamed the Northern Securities decision and described the action as a sharp decline but no panic As the Northern Securities case wended its way to the US Supreme Court General business conditions weakened and the drumbeat against trusts grew louder When the former lieutenant governor of Missouri admitted to a grand jury that he had been paid while in office $1000 by the Sugar Trust for literary services and another $750 by the Tobacco Trust and had been offered a similar amount by the Baking Powder Trust the drumbeat got more insistent With each revelation the outlook for all the trusts darkened taking the stock market lower since the trusts signified cooperation and size both of which led to higher profits As the Supreme Court sat for arguments on 14th December 1903 the Dow was at 46.70 down 27.4% for the year and 25.0% since the verdict against northern securities the case was decided by the supreme court on 14th march 1904 in preparation roosevelt had molded the court to his ends two of his new justices voted for the government along with john harlan the government's only vote in the night sugar case and two of the justices who had voted against the government in the night case the government won by the slimmest of margins 5 to 4 with harlan's opinion stating plainly that the sherman antitrust act meant that liberty of contract did not involve a right to deprive the public of the advantages of free competition in trade and commerce knox tried to calm the business world and the stock market by assuring them that there would be no running amok on controlling corporations the next day 15th march 1904 the stock market opened at 47.73 having fallen 29.3% the previous 12 months as roosevelt seemed to be ready for war it was down 5.3% for 1904 to date but rallied through the day to cut 1904's loss nearly in half with a gain of 2.5% the stock market had taken comfort in knox assurance roosevelt focused on raising the funds for his 1904 presidential campaign one likely reason knox didn't run amok and file additional suits after the northern securities decision was that wall street and the business world were expected to be a significant source of roosevelt's campaign funding with roosevelt and knox otherwise occupied the stock market was again enjoying a golden age the dow ultimately gained 41.7% in 1904 to close at 69.61 more than recovering the previous year's losses
While many had assumed that Knox promise not to run amok in March 1904 was pure political pragmatism, coming eight months before a presidential election, Roosevelt needn't have worried he beat the Democrat, Judge Alton Parker, convincingly, winning 56.4% of the vote and every state outside of the solidly Democratic South. In his inaugural address, Roosevelt barely mentioned business. It seemed to Wall Street that Roosevelt and Knox had moved to other battlefields. The Dow rose another 38.2% .2 in 1905 to close at 96.20. That two-year gain of 95.9% is still the greatest two-year return the American stock market has ever enjoyed, and the start of 1906 seemed like a continuation of the 1904-5 run. On 12 January 1906, the Dow closed above 100.00 for the first time ever, and by 19 January 1906, it was up 7.1% for the year, which was just 16 trading days old. One observer early in that year described a mammoth bull movement running its course on the New York Stock Exchange. Jack Morgan, son of J. P. running his father's eponymous firm while J. P. was traveling, noted in January 1906 the month that started the year so well, that it wasn't just professionals who were buying stocks. For the first time in three years the public, with stocks at their present high prices, have begun to come in and buy heavily. This may have been the first real instance of individual investors taking a big stake in the stock market. It would end badly less than two years later. The bad news began at 5.12 a.m. on Wednesday, 18 April 1906, when the northernmost 296 miles of the San Andreas Fault, from the California town of Hollister to Cape Mendocino, where the fault disappears into the Pacific Ocean, ruptured. The shaking lasted 55 seconds in what was ultimately an 8.3 magnitude earthquake. The eastern side of the fault had moved to the southeast by 24 feet. In San Francisco, the earthquake was bad but the fires that resulted from broken gas lines were worse because the quake had also broken the water mains. After firefighters pumped the sievers dry in an attempt to stop the flames, they sent word to the Presidio, the military fort overlooking the entrance to San Francisco Bay, requesting an army artillery battalion. With no water to fight the fires, the soldiers used dynamite to collapse buildings into heaps of rubble that they hoped would serve as fire breaks. More often, the explosions started new fires. Though almost none of San Francisco was insured against earthquakes, the vast majority of it was insured against fire. Having your house burned was the only way to get an insurance payment. So, in the days immediately following the quake, citizens with houses that had been heavily damaged by the quake but spared the fires, set their own homes ablaze. More than 27,500 buildings covering 500 square blocks, one half of the largest city west of the Rocky Mountains and the financial center of the American West, were gone. At least 225,000 residents, more than half of all San Franciscans, were homeless.